Today, Pulp Radio presents the Nick Danger adventure, Down Under Danger, with an introduction by its author and star, Phil Austin. Nick Danger, one of the most mysterious of fictional gumshoes, has been thought for years to be solely the invention of the writer Lem Pozzo, who began writing detective thrillers as a veteran G.I. Bill writing student just after World War II. Pozzo had previously been a clerk and a cook on duty in the South Pacific, and had briefly seen combat on Guam. His most popular Nick Danger books are four, the first of which, Cut Him Off at the Past, from 1949, has three times been adapted for film, most recently the critically acclaimed 1993 French film La Vie en Merde. It is as well a popular comedy album by the equally mysterious Firesign Theater. The second is The Three Faces of Al, 1953, a psychological thriller of multiple identity and opium. And the third, Danger in Dreamland, 1955, in which Nick takes on multiple murders in Tinseltown. And finally, Down Under Danger, 1963, which was lifted heavily from popular apocalyptic visions of the time. Lem Pozzo always said he made the character of Nick Danger up out of the whole cloth, but recent evidence I have cited in my book, Danger Revealed, puts forth the probable truth, that there was indeed a real Nick Danger, a small-time local Hollywood detective from whom Pozzo stole not only stories, but a complete identity. It's interesting to note that this real Nick Danger has a history that sounds as if it had been fabricated by Pozzo himself, who was never known to stick to a fact he couldn't color a bit more brightly. In any event, Nicholas Dangaropoulos, popularly known as Nick Danger, was born into a family of Greek sheep herders in Fresno, California, despite reports in the popular press in later years, evidently of his own making, that he was raised by a wealthy Maine industrialist named Jonas Acme. Acme, by the way, invented the name Acme and made a fortune putting it on commodities of all kinds. The simple peasants whom Danger falsely believed to be his parents, Golda and Heinz Crumhunger of Fryant, California, were not even Greeks, although they thought they were, and they were paid handsomely to keep him in the dark as to his real ancestry. Danger spent his youth happily chasing ewes in the hills of the Sierra Nevada and singing the popular songs of the era in the Basque hotels of Nevada and Central California. He was best known for the traditional Mi Corazon Mi Huevo. Unknown to him, he was in fact the son of King Creosote of Thebes, the king of poles and wire as he was known. His royal father abandoned him at birth for reasons best known to himself, and another son, Porky, deemed more suitable to rule, was raised in his place. Porky Dangaropoulos is now a prince and owns a yacht the size of Rhode Island and wears a bikini and is fat and covered with hair and has a perpetual tan and is surrounded by young babes from the former Yugoslavia eager for a good time and some hard currency with which to support their secret children. For danger, life was considerably different. He attended schools in Fresno, graduating from mental high school and quickly dropped out of college. After a stint in the army, in the secret military police, and by the way, he says others enlisted, he stinted and where on Guam he presumably first met Lem Pazzo, he found himself rootless in Los Angeles, or eyeless in Gaza, as his screenwriter friend Algis Isherwood once said. He was armed and highly trained in the arts of tracking, sabotage, deception, and deceit. So he joined the Bay City Police Department, but was forced out in a scandal of epic proportions. It was in fact said that the chesty stripper involved, Hale Stone, was of epic proportions herself. A long-running feud with the men promoted above him, especially Chief Ray Chandler and Lieutenant, later District Attorney Alvin Bradshaw, took his career to the depths. His only recourse was to become a private eye and continue, as he said to me once, bashing his thick head against a brick wall. Today, Danger is said to be retired and very old, but alive, which is more than could be said for Pazzo, who died miserably in 1980. His real adventures as a private dick are being chronicled by his biographer, in a series of hard-bitten stories that have attained much popular, though not literary, note. It's an interesting sidelight that Danger tried without success to sue Pozzo to establish his identity several times, but to no avail. Pozzo insisted until the end that Danger did not really even exist, except in his, Pozzo's, imagination. And this argument won the day in several sensational court cases in which the real Danger was not even allowed into the courtroom. There are some people, and I'm one of them, who suspect that there is no better world than this lousy and crooked one we see all around us. X3, read all about it. Car bursts into flame on city street as detective passes by. X3, X3, 
strange disappearance of continent of Australia. Ah, uh, maybe there's one or two optimists who might argue the matter. Yeah, sure. And maybe there's one or two saints left. And maybe even one or two heroes. And maybe there really is a Santa Claus. And maybe the Easter Bunny ate labeled Friar down at the mini super. But you find them for me, pal. And I'll lay you several to one that you just plain made them up. Hey, little guy. Got the night edition of the National Toilet? Here you go, Nick. Hot off the presses, whatever that means. Filled with murder and blackmail and dope and betrayal and the disappearance of an entire continent under mysterious circumstances. And be sure to read the comics. I laugh myself silly. <laughs> Thanks, Shorty. I'm not Shorty. Shorty was a little guy. Shorty got caught under his own car the other day. So he had to scrape the road to come up with enough to charge his family for the deluxe coffin. <laughs> See what I mean? Hell, the kind of goody-goodies who believe there is some better world than this. They're so few that they're what you'd have to call statistically irrelevant. But now that I think about it, so am I statistically irrelevant. And so are you. And that, my friend, is as true as the half-eaten facts of life on a cheap blue plate with a cigarette stuffed out in the cold, congealed gravy. <coughs> down like dingoes, death to the damned Australians. It is a far, far better thing we do than we have ever done before. Did I tell you my name? Well, if I did, you've forgotten it by now. And if I didn't, well, you'll find it out soon enough. And believe me, it won't mean nothing to you. Hey, danger! You owe me money! I'm just a grubby little guy like the rest of you poor slobs. Just a meager excuse for a human wheezing out his one sad tune on a calliope of compromise. Hey, that's pretty good. A tune on a calliope of compromise. Hello, Nick. Long time no see. Hello, Velma. I didn't know you spoke Chinese. What were we talking about? Nick. When am I going to see you again? Yeah, yeah. Later, baby. Oh, Nick. You know me. I'm the guy in your back alley. I'm the guy under your bed. I'm the guy between your cracks. I do all the things you'd never admit that you do. Only I do them better. That's what you nice people hire me for. To clean up your messes so you can convince yourself there's some better place than this. It's time once again for the adventures of Nick Danger, America's best-loved, least-understood detective, as created by America's take-no-prisoners best-selling author, Lem Pazzo. Nick Danger. He's got three eyes and two fists and a brain the size of a ripe cantaloupe. And tonight, we present the story that put Lem Pazzo's name up at the top of the bullet-riddled paperback lists. Get ready to hold on to yourself with terror. Get ready to hold on to someone else out of sheer fear. Get ready to listen to the sensational radio adaptation of the sizzling Nick Danger thriller, Down Under Danger. Hello, and thank you for calling the Nick Danger Detective Agency. This week, featuring a really special offer, Nick's Big Vengeance Deal. Three slimy divorce investigations for only the price of one. Thank you for calling. Did I say that? Please hold, and I'll return the favor. If you look a little like Mel Gibson. <laughs> that was a joke. We all know Australians are strictly illegal. What may I do you for? Hello? Hello? May I speak to Mr. Danger, please? That depends on your sob story, sister. Well, let's say I'm frightened and alone, and that I have the face of an angel and the body of someone that angels have to turn their faces away from on the street in order that they might begin quickly to pray. Mm-hmm. Well, frankly, I've heard all this before. How did you know my name? Are you kidding? How would I know your name? My name is Frankie. Although you probably said frankly. Frankly as a man's name. But still, isn't it an amazing coincidence? My name is Frankie. Whatever. Great. 
And what might your story be, kid? The great man don't just talk to anybody, see? And, uh, by the way, will this be paid for with a local check or <laughs> preferably cold, hard cash? Oh, don't you have a heart, lady? Let me explain myself the way I do best. Let me expose myself to someone who has seen through everything already. Put me through. Please. Please. Oh, for Christ's sake, hold on. Hey, Nick, I got a talking loony on line one. Ruth, when did we get more than one line? There is only one line, boss. That's why it's called line one. Oh. Uh, yeah. This is Nick Danger. So what, you ask? And believe me, I don't care much about it anymore myself. Oh, Nick, you don't know me. That's not saying much. I hardly know anyone these days. Even my best pals are walking softly behind my back with knives. So to hell with them. Oh, Nick, I feel just as sorry for you as you want me to. You do? That's right. You sound the way... Oh, I don't know. You sound the way you want me to think you want to sound... Oh, Nick, you've got to help me. Frankly, I don't think I'm much help to anyone these days. M my name's Frankie. Frankly oh. is a man's name. And besides, how can you even say that you're no help? Well, I can say it in a more dramatic way, like like this. You see, Frankie, my last case ended bad, real bad, like a bad penny. I hate that. It could be like a bad woman. I like that, yeah. My last case had ended bad, real bad, as bad as a bad girl under bad light in a bad situation. Yeah. The end had come when I pumped three quick bullets into the gorgeous dame's voluptuous chest, and she just flew apart like a balloon. Like two balloons. Get it? Yeah, yeah, I get it. That's good. Like two balloons uh, that had taken three quick slugs after being filled full of blood-red jello. Her insides gushed inside out like... like, uh, well, nobody's business. That's it? Y yeah. Well, I suppose I need to work on that last part a little bit. A little bit? A lot. I guess you do. Say, are you trying to write your memoirs or something? Well, I suppose so. I mean, I don't have a deal with a publisher or anything. Well, don't look at me. I don't know anyone in the book business. I can't look at you. You're on the uh, phone. <laughs> I forgot. Where were we? Page five. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, Nick, I need to see you now, before it's too late. It's generally too late when someone says something like that on page five. Well, here's something you've never heard before. I'm guilty. Yeah. I'm guilty as hell, guilty as sin, and you've got to cover it up. And I don't have any money to pay you with, so I guess you'll just have to take what you can get. So, that's how this one began. And it was already better than the usual kind of beginning I get stuck with. At least she sounded sexy as all hell. We made a date to meet over at the Crippled Poodle, a cheap gin joint over in Muertadina. It was a dirty little place, the Crippled Poodle populated with the usual collection of half-lit barflies. There wasn't one sign of the dame who called herself Frankie. What'll it be, pal? You look like you could use something short and straight. Hell, I'd prefer it if she was tall and kind of curvy. Oh, great. We got us a literary type. Well, hurry it up, friend. I ain't got all day. Forget it. Forget what? I don't remember. Give me a short, fast drink with a hint of something wary in it and then stay away from me if you value your mental health. And make it snappy. We don't make it snappy. We just pour out of two bottles into one glass and set it down in front of you with a cute cocktail napkin underneath. You know, it wouldn't bother me at all to see you writhing on the ground with your guts punched up into what passes for a brain and your obviously hollow skull. Jeez, I get it. We got us a kind of literary tough guy. I looked around the place. There were lava lamps on the tables and cheap beer on the floor, and there were netted candle lamps casting weird shadows on the hopeless faces face down on the formica tabletops. There were vacant stairs, and there were empty chairs and a couple of squares, and still I didn't see her. I looked around at every loser in this dingy place, and I sipped the stiff concoction the bartender brought me. Here you go, pal. I told myself I'd give it five more, and at the end of then I'd go. And then the door opened and the air was still, and every head in the place turned around twice like it was raffle night at the Exorcist Club. Wow. This one was really something. Wow, this, this is, is really something. I had to admit there was a whole lot more woman here than I could have bargained for. Hell, I wouldn't have even known who to bargain with, except I'd be willing to bet he'd have a pointy tail and a couple of horns. You must be Nick Danger. Yeah, that's me. What's it to you? Not much. 
yet. Although you ain't exactly bad looking for someone who looks like he's been beaten to a pulp one too many times. Can a girl sit down? If that dress was any tighter, I'd say no, but on the other hand, give it a try. If something rips, we'll all be the happier. Yeah, we'll all be the happier. There. No rips. You like what you see? Uh, I've seen it all before. Just not quite so much of it in one place. Hi, Frankie. What'll it be? The usual, Eddie. And hold the unusual. Coming up, doll. <laughs> By the way, this guy here, he's no damn good. I'll be the judge of that. Are you any damn good? Some people think so. I don't know why I came here. I never come here. Eddie doesn't seem to think so. On the phone, you said you were guilty of something big and you needed my help to cover it up, remember? I say a lot of things on the phone. I don't mean a whole lot of them. <laughs> oh, Nick, what do you think? What do you mean? Do you think there's some place somewhere for people like you and me? Some better place where things are different? Everything in me wanted to say yes. For once in my life, I wanted to believe it, but I didn't. There you go, kid. That's a big olive. I'm a big girl. She had me drive her out to a big house on a point overlooking the ocean. You know the place. The big waves crash on a big white sand beach that some big rich white family owns for years. It was a beautiful view. You could see all the way to Australia on a clear day with the right image-sensing satellite equipment and a team of experts in low-orbiting rocket planes. None of these types was around on this night, but then I'd heard Australia wasn't around much either. There was only this dame named Frankie, and she was so beautiful and so uncovered, and worse, there was something about her that brought out the best in me. I wanted to protect her. I wanted to cover for her. I wanted to make her mine. I wanted to go shopping for her. I wanted to let her tell me how to drive. She told me to park it in the big cobblestone driveway, and I did. And then she told me to follow her inside the house, and I did that, too. Is this your place? I thought it had been confiscated early on when they found Australians up here. No, no, it's my family's place. Watch your step, Nick. There's a dead body around here someplace. I forget exactly where I left it. Kind of a big guy wearing boxing gloves. He had a pouch. You can't mistake him. Frankie, come on. Level with me. You've got to be kidding. I never kid about murder. It's not a laughing matter. <laughs> That's a hot one. You're trying to tell me you killed a kangaroo? That's not only crazy, it's extremely legal. All Australians are fair game now that they don't have an existing homeland, and marsupials, hell, they've been serving them up in burgers in Oregon. Here, Nick. I guess we could both use a gimlet. Okay. What were we talking about? Oh, yes, Australians. Australians. I remember now. He tried to hit me with a lethal one-two combination. Yeah. I, I pushed him back on his tail, and he yeah. rolled right out the window into the surf. I saw him fall like it was in slow motion, turning endlessly over and over, finally to splash into the trough behind a big set of waves. If I'd have dropped him a few seconds earlier, he could have ridden his last wave into shore. He loved to surf. Uh, do you mind me asking who this kangaroo belonged to? I, I mean, before you killed him? Joey? Nobody owned Joey. He'd knocked out 15 men in 14 rounds. He was his own man. He was a damn kangaroo. He had a pouch, it's true, but he kept a snub nose 45 in it because arthritis had done in his fists. He wasn't just any kangaroo. She got up slowly then, as if to look for something. She had on red spike heels, and her stacked body was silhouetted right through the thin dress with the painted parrots on it and the light from the evil moon streaming through the big windows, through which I could see the long lines of rollers breaking on the beach. I grabbed her, and she grabbed me, and before you knew it, her tongue was finding places in me that my own saliva <laughs> had abandoned years ago. Her lithe body seemed to cup to me, and we fell to the expensive tongue and groove and tore at each other's clothes. 
Then I noticed something was wrong. In the darkness above us, somewhere among the curved bamboo chairs and the slanting shadows thrown by moonlight through the Venetian blinds, I sensed some kind of movement, and I, I went after it. <coughs> Turn on some lights, baby. Let's see who the guy with the glass jaw is. Oh! Eddie, you big bastard. I told you not to when you followed me. Jeez, pal, lay off of me. You really pack a wallet. Nah, I'm finally beginning to get it. An Australian, huh? Huh? Me? You gotta be kidding, mate. Being an Aussie's an invitation for the bounty hunters. Oh, yeah. No one but a bona fide Australian would know what a wallop even is and how to hide them when you pack. What are you talking about, Nick? Eddie's no Australian, whatever that is. Eddie's as American as 100% pie. You poor kid. Is that what he told you? You're a little bartender, buddy. Here's really a card-carrying Aussie, ain't you, mate? You're crazy. Go ahead and search me, copper. See, typical Australian. Nobody's called anyone a copper in this country since the 20s. So you and Joey were hiding out, right? No, he's known for his left. Not anymore. Oh, you don't know he's dead. You don't know that Frankie here killed him? What? Oh, no. Jojo dead? I'll kill you for this, Frankie! Not this time, pal. <laughs> I shoved Eddie's head into the wall so hard it made the sound of a ripe cantaloupe hitting a cement wall. He dropped like a stone, like the kind of big stone that falls from the top of a 20-story building with pinpoint accuracy right onto a ripe cantaloupe. Oh! You bastard. You didn't have to do that. He was a nice kid. You mean, he was a nice kid. He's dead? He's joined Jojo, I imagine. They're both singing to some reverse southern hemisphere angels now. Hold it, baby. I've got to get out of here. Hold it. Let me go. You aren't covered up enough to get away from here without being spotted. I wouldn't use spots. I'd have stripes. And I'd lay low and follow existing trails of deer or wolverines or something. God, Nick, human life seems to mean nothing to you. Only my own, sweetheart. Now, suppose you tell me why I'm here and how you're going to help explain Eddie in a world where Australians are illegal and kangaroos are dead. Oh, Nick, it's sort of a long story. Oh. Uh, do you have a video version of it? Uh, better yet, do you have a promo of the video version that my staff could review? Nick, you're so cold. Murder just plain cools me right down, baby. Now, here's the deal. In a minute or two, I'm going to get a steely look on my rugged face, and I'm going to walk over to that phone, and I'm going to call the cops. I'm going to tell them I've got a dead Australian and a dame that probably croaked him and his marsupial, so if you don't want that to happen, you better tell me something with at least a couple of shades of truth to it. You won't have to call the police, Nick. You see, I already did. I don't get it. Danger, I'm putting you away. What for, Lieutenant Fish? Eh, don't worry. We'll think of something. <laughs> they took me down to the Bay City holding tank then, and they didn't have to turn the siren on because they beat me up so bad my screams did the job. I'd been through these bastards before. No one was ever going to forgive me for the old days. When I finally woke up, Detective Lieutenant Hamilton Fish was strutting around like he owned the joint, although I could remember when him and me was just rookies. That was before the world closed in on me and opened up for him. It's all over for you on this one, Danger. We pulled Jojo out of the bay yesterday, and there yeah. was a slug in him that had your name written all over it. Come on, Fish. It'd take an angel to write my name on a thirty-eight hollow point. Yeah, she is pretty good looking, ain't she? Frankie? She's framing me for the dead marsupial? Hey, how about the dead Australian? Oh, no, she, she's setting me up for something she probably did herself. Can't you see it, Fish? I can see it, Nicky. Hey, believe me, I like what I see. <laughs> they tossed me back in a cell so I could think about my bad luck a little more. I figured Ruth would get worried pretty soon and send someone to look for me, but the way things were going, it might be too late any minute now. Hey, danger. Pretty yourself up. You got a visitor. It was her, of course. She right. She had on some little hat that set off the henna in her hair and nails that were as long as a bandicoot's and her lips. And her lips. She snuggled up close to me as soon as the goon turned his back. Oh, Nick. I'm sorry this had to happen to you. 
And then she slapped me hard, real hard. Take that, you bastard. Jeez. I may just be hey. a woman to you, but that doesn't mean you've got the right to moralize about my imagined behavior. What the hell do you know about my life, anyway? Oh, yeah? What is it about dames like you? You can't stay away from Australians, can you? Nick, you don't mind if I get a cigarette? And then she reached into her clever little purse shaped like a flightless bird and she pulled out a clean needle and some clean, fresh heroin and with a little smile she injected it right into mm. her bare little arm. This was a new twist. I felt myself go all cold and soft. I hated needles and, oh yeah, did I mention? She had a gun trained on me. Ah, oh, that's better. I'm going away, Nick. Far away from here. Just stay where you are. Okay, okay, baby. Oh, that's... A whole lot better. Go ahead, baby. I've got nothing to lose. Like I told you at the beginning, I've reached the end of a road that turned out to go nowhere. What's that? Jeez. I grabbed for the bars and stared out the little window of my cell that overlooked the bay. Out in the water, a huge wave boat just ahead of the entire continent of Australia as it hove into view offshore of the old amusement pier. So that was the deal. Australia hadn't disappeared at all. It had drifted, on purpose if my guess was worth anything. It looked like they'd moved the whole place here so Australians running for their miserable lives could just row out to safety. Well, I've got to go. That's my ride. You see, Nick, Jojo knew something. Something too big. He knew there was an alternate world to this one. Another place. A place where a marsupial didn't have to strap on the gloves. A place where a gal like me could be happy. Yeah, so you killed him. Give me a break. You're saying that the better world than this one is Australia? You got that right, big boy. And now I'm hopping on board and I'm gonna ride that big old flat continent to wherever it takes me. I know I shouldn't be saying this, but stay with me, baby. Let me take care of you. I haven't got a soul in this world to care about. I don't even have a cat. Oh, Nick. There's just something about you that incites pity in a girl like me. That part about the cat really got me. Oh, I'm no damn good, and I know it. But you're not much better, are you, Nick? Whatever you say, baby. I had to keep her talking, that's all I knew. The gun in her hand was starting to drift away from where it had been, and that was aimed straight at my private parts. I could see she was beginning to get so high she was floating. She let the gun droop a little bit more, and I saw my chance, and I took it. We'll return to Nick Danger in a moment. But first, a word from a continent that's superior to all other continents, both in regard to fit and taste. Australia, another world. It's the land of logical alternatives. Australia, where the pulp is separated from the shaft by the winds of fresh change. Australia, where the wind comes sweeping across the plain. Australia, where men are men and women aren't sure that's all that good an idea. Australia, where up is down and north is south and where the mountains plunge straight into the earth and the seas are warm and the rain flows up out of the ground and animals have purses and birds can't fly, and the beer is as nourishing as whiskey. What the hell was going on? I could see myself lying on the floor of the cell, and I looked real dead to me. If that was true, then who the hell was I? And was I hearing voices in my head? Sorry, Mr. Danger flew the coop. We think he's in Australia. If that's true, he's a fugitive from normalcy, and probably is left-handed where once he was right. Extra, extra, read all about it. Australia declared outside realm of human experience. Peace returns to Northern Hemisphere. Local detective murdered by corrupt police. Come on, Fish. Just because you resurrected me from the dead doesn't mean I ain't gonna row out to the home country the minute your back is turned. No, 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 Eddie. I'm on a lamb myself. I wanted to row out with you. Hello? No, I'm sorry, Mr. Danger has disappeared, and the police are denying they croaked him. Oh, Jojo, can you ever forgive me? Ow! Don't hit me! Please! So this was that better world that everyone wanted so much. Well, I didn't know if I wanted it. 
I liked being alive and in the old crooked world better. I floated like a ghost out of the Bay City Jail and down the hill to the amusement pier that didn't seem so damn amusing anymore, and I watched them all getting into the clown boats and heading out to Australia. So this was to be the bitter end of this story. And while it didn't leave me with much more than the usual feelings of remorse and the usual lump on the skull and the usual empty wallet and the usual lack of a corporeal body at least, it could be finished off with a good ending line like, like this one. When you look back at the twisted trail of your life like a crooked thread spun through a crooked world by the big spider in the sky, after you've eaten the fruit and spit out the pulp, after you've used up all the metaphors, there's finally only one thing that can be truly said. And, hell, I've forgotten what it is. But I know one thing. You can spell it. Danger. Down Under Danger was written by Phil Austin and was produced and directed by Michael Packer with assistance from Phil Austin. It starred Phil Austin as Nick Danger with Andrea Guilford as Frankie, David Moore as Eddie, Kim McDaniel Roebuck as Ruth, and Ed Buchanan as Detective Fish. Also featured in the cast were Sue Bradford, John S. Douglas, Jim Middleton, Dave Middleton, John Schiali, Jerry Stearns, Eva Swidek, Red Noise, and Michael Packer. Production assistant was Jerry Stearns. Travel support provided by Lake Michigan Car Ferry. Pulp Radio is a co-production of Sparks Media and WGVU Radio with support from the Arts Foundation of Michigan in conjunction with the Michigan Council for the Arts and Cultural Affairs. For information about purchasing tapes of the Pulp Radio series, contact Sparks Media at Post Office Box 3540, Grand Rapids, Michigan, 49501. That's Sparks Media, Post Office Box 3540, Grand Rapids, Michigan, 49501. Thank you.